Okay, so welcome to the latest webinar in our JET alumni webinar series. My name is Bahia Simons Lane, and I am the executive director of US JET AA. I was a JET in Gunma Prefecture from 2005 to 2007, and I will be moderating today's webinar. First, I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Emily Frank. Thank you, Emily, for joining us. My pleasure. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to introduce USJAA, which is the United States Japan Exchange and Teaching Program Alumni Association. USJAA is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that furthers the US Japan relationship by supporting alumni of the JET program. We provide resources for individual JET alumni, JET alumni chapters nationwide, and potential JET participants. We support the leadership of JET alumni chapters with programming, membership recruitment, chapter management, leadership, professional development, and fundraising. And we help support the JET program and engage with the US Japan community. If you're a JET program alumni on this webinar and are already a member, I encourage you to join for free today at usjetaa.org. We currently run four annual programs. The first is a partnership with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA which provides grant funding to JET alumni chapters and subchapters so that they can hold events in their local communities that will help further the US-Japan relationship. JET AA chapters can apply for our second round of grant funding for this program by October 26. We also facilitate a leadership program which is funded by the Japan Foundation, CGP and Claire, where representatives from US JET AA visit JET alumni chapters and subchapters to hold tailored workshops focused on leadership and growth. Applications for this program are accepted on a rolling basis. Our third program is this webinar series. We hold two different webinar series. One is targeted at JET alumni chapter leaders, and the other is for individual JET alumni. Our next webinar will be on October 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. That webinar is titled, So You Finished the JET Program, Now What? Featuring JET alumni with expertise and careers in recruiting, including today's speaker, Emily Frank. This webinar will help you figure out how JET fits into your career path, help you describe your JET experience in a way that employers will understand, teach you how to utilize LinkedIn, and much more. Our last program is the microgrant initiative in which we partner with the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo to offer funding to current American JETs for projects in their schools and communities. Applications for this year's program will open in October. And then I'd also like to thank the Japan US Friendship Commission for their generous donations of in-kind and monetary. Um, before I turn the mic over to Emily, I would like to let the listeners know that we will be recording this webinar and posting it on our website for those who can't attend. There will be time for questions at the end, so please hold your questions or type them using the chat or Q&A features. To ask a question at the end, you can use the raise hand function, and I will unmute you and let you know when it's your turn to speak. Now, without further ado, here's Emily. All right. Thank you, Bahia, and thank you all for being here. Um, so, um, why is my slide not progressing? Uh, so, Bahia, I'm, I seem to be having more technical problems. My slides are not progressing. Uh, let me see. Um, it, there might be um, some arrows at the very bottom of the webinar screen. Uh, nope. Let me see. Hmm. Are, are you able to progress them on your end? Let me try. Okay. Uh, no, but okay. I could, Hold I could on, let me share. Try. Let me try getting in this way. Okay, I don't know. Was this there we go. Okay, apologies, everyone. I'm uh, apparently not as tech savvy as I like to pretend like I am. So, anyway, all right. Thank you very much. All right, so um, let me get started. So, uh, as you saw on an earlier slide, um, I also am a JET alum. Um, and just to give you a little kind of accidental piece about my age, and you can tell that this is kind of a 90s picture. Um, and um, so what I want to talk to you today really is, um, I absolutely know your pain. Um, when I first got back from Japan, 
um, in the 90s, um, I was kind of lost. Uh, I didn't know what to do. Uh, got kind of stuck in a few things. Um, and eventually, I went into grad school for counseling. So uh, the reason that's important, I think, is uh, we have this kind of semi-joke in mental health work that is you go to where your greatest pain is. So I became a career counselor because I did not know what I wanted to do. So I've got 12 years of experience in career counseling. Um, and in this past sort of more like year, year and a half-ish, I've worked with uh, close to 50 JET alumni kind of helping folks figure out what is next. Um, and I hope to be able to provide that service for all of you as well. Um, so here are some things that we will cover today. Um, the worksheet is not really a worksheet, it's just kind of a slide, but I would say um, to each of you, um, be ready to be really kind of thoughtful about some of this. Uh, and I will ask you um, to kind of jot a few things down as you go through all of this. I also want to be sure that I talk about uh, what I've noticed as common themes for us. Uh, and then a little piece of how to really talk about the experiences you've had. And then uh, to wrap up, a few tips on some resumes. So let me jump right on in. One of the things that I have noticed is that people tend to kind of downplay their values when they're looking for jobs. But they're really essential and they are the things that will keep you content in your job. So when you can line your values up with everything else in your life, um, you are gonna feel happier at work and you're gonna burn out less, uh, or potentially not at all. Um, and when I talk to people who are really kind of violating their values, they're living and, and working in ways that don't make sense to them personally, um, they just get really kind of unhappy. Um, I tend to call this burnout, but you can certainly call it the things I've mentioned here, dissatisfaction, discouragement, etc. But your values are actually fairly easy to identify. You can find some quizzes online and, and if you have, um, if, you, if you want or if you have questions about it, um, drop me an email at the end of this webinar because I have a um, sheet that I can send you as well. What I want you to think about, though, with your values is um, really what's essential to you. If you find one of the quizzes online or if you follow mine, um, it's obviously somebody else's language um, around it. Uh, and that might be helpful to you, but it might not. So I will mention a few common values that people have. Um, a lot of folks, for example, need a lot of autonomy in the workplace, and that can be things like uh, the ability to arrive at work um, at a time that makes sense to them instead of a hard and fast rule that it has to be eight o'clock. Uh, that includes things like the ability to do your own work in a way that's sensible to you. Um, certainly the kind of money that you take home and the kind of benefits you receive from a job can be part of your values. Uh, if you have questions about that, like I said, do a quick online search or um, drop me an email and I can send you my um, fairly quick quiz. On my quiz, I actually make you identify your top, I believe it's five values. Uh, those are the ones that I consider really core to you, really essential to your work happiness. So if you find a quiz online, I would say do that anyway. Go through the things you've ranked highest and decide which, um, say, three to five of those are the things that you really cannot live without. All right, so just a quick, that's my sort of quick mention of values. Uh, the next piece, this is my kind of worksheet-ish. The next thing I really want you to think about is, is who, who are you? Um, this is a really important piece when you are considering what you're going to be doing next. So um, take a moment, if you would, to make a note. Who are you? What kinds of cool things do you offer to a new employer? How, what sets you apart? Um, and um, how do those things kind of weave in with some of your needs and some of your values at work? And if you're having trouble with this, think about this last bullet point here, the last time that you really felt engaged and energized. This doesn't have to be a work task. If you just last week uh, wound up um, coaching a neighborhood kid's basketball game, 
uh, and that felt really good and you felt very excited and very engaged, that absolutely counts. Um, so I'm going to give you all a moment or two here just to jot down um, a few of these um, pieces that are really essentially you. I won't take long, but I'm going to give you a minute just to write a few things down. All right, I hope that was enough time, but definitely feel free, obviously, to keep writing uh, as I move on to the next piece. And if you have any questions about that, be sure that you do um, jot those down for yourself so you can ask them when we get to our Q&A. Okay, ooh. And suddenly it's not reflect, it's not uh, progressing. There we go, okay. So, um, I mentioned at the beginning that I have noticed some definite themes um, with JET alumni. And um, I think these are particularly interesting and, and they may provide some ideas for you. The first thing I really notice about those of us who have had experience living and working overseas is that a lot of people really want a way to be of service to the larger world. So I see a lot of people going into things like NGOs, the Foreign Service, refugee resettlement. Um, I do see a lot of people kind of burning out from some of those, particularly things like um, nonprofit organizations and refugee resettlement. Those can be um, tough fields to work in. Um, and the refugee issues in particular, uh, someone I talked to about that recently said, it's so hard because it changes every single day. Uh, some of that's certainly the political climate, but some of it, of course, is just that those are tougher situations to work in, and they can be really very tiring for people. Uh, I do see, fairly obviously, a lot of people going into education. Um, I will say I, I don't see as many people going into K-12 teaching. I see more people in post-secondary. A lot of folks who want to work with international students, a lot of people who want to do kind of study abroad kinds of programs, that sort of thing. Um, the DACA and immigration stuff actually overlaps a bit with education. I certainly see um, a lot of, I have seen a lot of folks who want to, to work with um, undocumented immigrant students more in the post-secondary um, setting. But I also do see a lot of folks who are very interested in law and immigration policy, uh, international politics in a broader sense obviously also culture and language. A uh, few people have wanted to do some translation work, but more than that, I see people who want to educate others uh, on things like international relations, cultural sensitivity, um, et cetera. And of course, a lot of people doing travel. Um, the way people do travel, again, changes a lot and, and depends on the individual, but um, certainly a lot of people want to get people to Japan um, and kind of thinking about um, you know, Asia in a broader sense and what people can um, potentially do there. So those are just kind of some interesting observations. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about how you can talk about what your experience overseas has been. So a few years ago, uh, an organization called um, the National Organization of Colleges and Employers, so, sorry, the National Association of Colleges and Employers, did a survey of their employer organizations. And one of the things that really stood out to me was how many of the um, surveyed organizations really wanted people with international experience. It was something like 62% said that that was a, a thing that they looked for um, in their new hires. Um, some of it is certainly because they're going, um, they're expanding their operations overseas, um, but some of it is just that they believe that those are really valuable skills that you um, come to the organization with a greater sense of understanding of the world. Um, but, you know, places are entering new marketplaces and, and our economy worldwide is becoming more international. Uh, you also probably have a greater understanding of some more typical cultural and business norms than someone who uh, has never worked overseas before. So that means that you can help folks really um, 
by folks, I mean potential employers, to develop some global solutions uh, and really address some universal problems. You can also demonstrate that you are a really great bridge for cultural differences and gaps. What that tends to look like in the real world is uh, just kind of not making assumptions. You have probably all noticed that as Americans, we have tended, in broadly speaking, to assume that ours is the very best way possible. And I don't think it's ill-intentioned. I think that's just the culture we grew up with. And simply by having spent time overseas, you're going to have a more sensitive approach to that than a lot of your colleagues. And so um, you will get to be kind of the, the person in the room who says, well, hang on, um, maybe people in this place do this differently. Uh, and again, let me know if you have questions about kind of what this looks, might look like specifically in your world. Um, but I think it's a really uh, crucial piece to add. You've also gained some leadership problem solving and communication skills without even working on it. Uh, for instance, when you um, first went to, um, say, the grocery store and had to figure out um, how to navigate that, that's really big problem solving skills. It's not the kind of thing uh, that you likely had to experience in your American life. Um, you had to do some problem solving when um, strange things happened. Um, I had to do, for example, um, I blew a fuse in my apartment. I had no idea where the fuse box was, and I did not know how to say fuse. So um, I had to run down to my neighbor's uh, apartment below me and say, um, my apartment is suddenly very dark. And <laughs> those kinds of language problem solving skills uh, as well as the ability to um, kind of get outside of your normal comfort zone are really key. The other thing is you've gained a lot of um, kind of demonstrable proof that you're an independent, self-reliant person, that you're adaptable, open-minded, patient, and tolerant. And these are all really, really wonderful things that almost every employer is looking for. So this is actually, as you might have guessed, from the dates me. So, uh, if you see on a job application that um, the skills they're looking for include this exceptional interpersonal communications, blah, 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 um, you can actually have this kind of information on your resume already. So you'll see that I have demonstrated to junior high English language learners, blah, blah, blah. Um, so think about this and, and feel free to um, make notes about this kind of thing. You'll see also that I have the cross-cultural understanding piece on here um, and the government translation work. I don't feel that the government translation work is necessarily uh, essential, um, but I did do some of it and I thought it sounded fairly impressive, so I kept it on my, my resume um, back when I was a person who needed to have my own resume. Uh, this will obviously vary depending on the kinds of positions that you're looking for. Um, I worked in higher ed uh, here in the Denver area for many years, uh, and so these um, interpersonal communication skills and the rapport building were really essential for what I did, and I also worked with a really diverse group of students. So these kinds of skills were very important in what I did. I will be happy to chat with you a little more individually if you have uh, other questions about uh, kind of what this might look like for you as well. So that brings us then to resumes more generally. I, I've talked to a lot of people who are very concerned about keeping their resumes to a single page. I would say don't worry too much about it. Uh, but I will say that unless you have an extremely compelling reason, I would generally recommend that you not have a resume that's longer than two pages. You'll see here that there are some obvious exceptions. Um, academics tend to have more sort of CVs and they have chapters and they're insanely long. The rest of us tend not to need them any longer than two pages. And the other part is that I think if you're going to get onto the second page, you might as well fill it up. Uh, that way it looks really robust and fancy and impressive. I will be glad to talk to you a little bit more about what kinds of things to put in there if you have specific questions. I tend also not to like really fancy formatting. Uh, I think many people um, make the document look really elegant, but what often suffers is the content. So I really favor a simpler format 
Um, some nice clean bullets, nothing crazy fancy, not like a bunch of columns and crazy images. And you're going to want to submit it as a PDF. Uh, there are rare opportunities, uh, rare options rather, where you can't do that. Um, there's just not uh, a place to attach a PDF and you might have to cut and paste for some particular uh, kinds of careers and, and jobs, but let me know if you have questions about that. Definitely, when you're writing your resume, think about what is going to be important to the potential new employer and arrange it in that order. Make sure that the stuff that you think, think is likely to be extremely important to them gets on top. Don't bury it at the bottom and don't worry too much about arranging it chronologically. What you can do in order to arrange it in order of importance is to have a section at the top that says something like relevant uh, experience or um, you know, if, if you wanted to be, uh, let's say, uh, a nutritionist, then you could head it with something like um, healthcare experience, those kinds of things. And so you can grab that information and throw it right up to the top. I also really like, in general, to lead with um, a very beginning part that is um, some sort of a summary or some highlights. Uh, and that can be whatever you want it to be, but it will allow you then to talk about what you think um, is likely to be really eye-catching to them or to enumerate the um, qualifications that they have listed in the job description. So if they've said, you know, we need someone with three years of experience, in your summary you can have over five years of experience doing that thing. So the bad news is I do really, really recommend that you tailor your resume for each job that you're interested in. Now you can have a generic one that kind of goes out on sites like LinkedIn, um, but what you'll want to do when you're applying for actual jobs is really tailor that particular one. If you are considering two or three different jobs or, or kinds of ways to use your experience, you might wind up then with kind of template resumes for each of those. So one would be called something like teaching resume and one will be called translating resume, that kind of thing. And then you'll just tailor each of those based on the job description that you see. I am a real bear about grammar, spelling, and punctuation. I can't tell you the number of times when I worked in higher ed that I refused to consider an applicant for a position based on poor grammar, spelling, and punctuation. Be really careful with this. You might get someone who's really picky like me. I just say operate from the assumption that you will. If you have questions about any of that, run your resume by someone else. So if you have, uh, say, an uncle who's really good at grammar, run it by him. Um, and in fact, run it by as many people as you can. It always makes me a little bit crazy to see people who have sort of apologies in their resumes. You'll see something like, while I lack experience in blah, uh, don't do that. Um, say, you know, I have experience in this, and it looks like what you're looking for in this way. Um, there's a lot of debate floating around out there about dates on your resume. The reason I really encourage you to have them on there is that if there's, first of all, if there's a resume without dates, and that is a criterion for a position, uh, if it says, you know, required five years of sales experience, and you just have sales jobs listed on there, they don't have a way to quantify that you have the minimum five years that they need. And often for things like that, they're going to be assigning points as they go through the resume. So if they have a, a minimum of five years of experience and you have 10, then you have just uh, shot up to the top of the points you can get on that particular section. The other thing is that generally employers are not going to make the best kinds of assumptions if there aren't dates on there. If you don't have the date you graduated from college, for instance, and honestly that's a little bit of a stretch, that one I, I'm okay if you skip, but if it's not on there, they're not going to assume that you graduated recently. They're going to assume that you're really old or you have spent a lot of time in prison and have reason to hide your experience or something really bad like that. Um, so and if there are other more compelling reasons that you don't want dates on there, let me know. We can go through that a little bit together. But as a rule, I think it's better to have the information on there than not to. And then finally, um, you're going to want to understand Applicant Tracking Systems, or ATS. Now, if you've never heard of those before, don't worry. 
I've got you covered. <laughs> so an applicant tracking system is a system that many, most I would say employers are now using to help them with the hiring process. So because it is so easy these days for individuals to um, apply with the click of a button, what that means for the employers is that they'll get hundreds of applicants for a job. And what they have generally found is that most of those people aren't actually qualified for that job. So they needed a way to manage that. As a rule, the people who are um, tasked with deciding who at least gets in for an interview are not people whose sole responsibility that is. They're people who work in other places at the employer and have this kind of added on to their duties. So the easier this process can be for them, the better. So applicant tracking systems are really bots that search for things like keywords in your application. Not every applicant tracking system does a keyword search. Uh, some people swear that that is the old fashioned approach to it, but in higher ed, at least, that has been kind of the way it's been organized. So that means uh, if, if they said something like that they're looking for a proven multitasker, you're probably going to have to have the word multitasker somewhere on your resume or it's going to get kicked out. Now the hard part is what do you, how do you know what this looks like? How do you know what those keywords are? It can be really tricky because you didn't write the job description. So you don't know what people are flagging in their heads is really essential. So the good news is there's actually a free uh, service that you can use. Um, I like jobscan.co. Um, check it out. If you use JobScan, it will give you five free scans in a month. And so what you do on the site is you paste in uh, your resume and the job description. And it compares the two and says, here are the keywords that you aren't using. Here are the keywords that they have used more often than you. Uh, and it actually gives you a score. You're looking for a score of 80 or higher on that in order to get past the applicant tracking systems and get seen by a human being. The new piece is they are really recommending that you have a physical address on your document. Many of the new applicant tracking systems look for an address and they won't see it if it's in there as a header. So go ahead and put a physical address on there. I know it feels really old school, but there are some, um, some systems that really do look for that. Uh, and the other thing that you can do that feels a little bit more natural and organic is you can actually go through the job description yourself and note anything that they mention really frequently. If they note it really often in the job description, you can take it um, as, as a given that that is probably a keyword that they're looking for. Uh, and you can kind of skim it as well and see what they appear to be really looking for uh, as really essential qualifications for the job. Now, uh, JobScan is going to try to have you, like most things, um, use their paid version. Their paid version is very, very expensive. I don't recommend it. So I would recommend saving the free scans for things that you feel really excited about and things that you think would be a really good fit for you and trying to do um, a piece of this on your own for things that feel like they could be okay. Uh, again, let me know if you have questions about what this is going to look like for you personally. So here is just a very quick sample resume. Uh, and you'll see here that I'm recommending that you be very specific. So for example, at skill number two, I have hotel software experience, including blah, blah, blah. Um, do be specific. And if you want to list things like language skills, be sure that you are putting your level on there. Don't just put Spanish. Put, you know, uh, fluent in Spanish or excellent conversational Japanese language or anything like that that really demonstrates for them what it looks like. Uh, you can also have things like proven ability to whatever. Now, this is a one page document. Yours, as I said earlier, does not have to be one page, but you're going to want to lead with your relevant experience and then have your degree at the bottom. And the uh, format in the US for resumes is to have um, the more recent experience on top and to work backwards in time. So for instance, under your education, if you have a, an advanced degree, you're gonna to wanna to put that on top. You'll also see here that I have things like your job titles and your degree name in boldface. I recommend that 
instead of things like the degree granting university or the employer name. The employer name is not very impressive to them and doesn't really demonstrate what you're able to do, whereas the job title does a lot more of that. You'll also see here that under the bullet points, I'm talking about your skills and accomplishments, and I'm, I am generally encouraging you to start with strong verbs. So that looks like um, demonstrated intercultural understanding by. Try not to get stuck in the really common trap of just listing what you did in the job. And I don't recommend that you have a little point underneath your job title that says responsibilities included. To me, responsibilities included always feels very passive. And the thing you don't want with your resume is to imply passivity. You're really looking to demonstrate in this document that you are a, a go-getter, that you are a person who demonstrates initiative, that you are able to do all of these things and really kind of bring the company up to the level that it could be. So typically, under your experience, I recommend say three to five bullet points that have those nice strong verbs. If you are no longer at that job or if the thing was a one-time task, go ahead and put it in the past tense uh, and, and write it in the first person narrative voice. So don't say demonstrates or shows or anything like that. Say, um, you know, demonstrated initiative by those kinds of things. You have the option, you'll see at the very bottom, to list some relevant coursework if you want to. This is very optional, uh, and I would relate it to the position you're seeking, um, but some people feel that there is a piece of what they're able to do that they have not adequately demonstrated in the experience section, so that can be a place to have that um, as kind of an add-on. But you'll see also that this is towards the bottom of the document. So uh, try not to put too much of your really essential stuff at the bottom of the document or uh, on the second page. You wanna lead with your strongest stuff and you want to really impress them with this first, say two thirds of the first page so that they will keep reading onto the second page. All right, so that is the content I have for you all here and this is my uh, contact information. If you have questions, the easiest way to reach out to me is going to be by dropping me an email. It's emily at denvercareercatalyst.com. Uh, I would be more than glad to talk to you each about kind of where you are in this process. Um, so let me know also if you would like to um, schedule a free half hour um, kind of check-in call to cover a few of these things. You can certainly also uh, check out my website and you can call me. Um, I tend to be a little bit less attentive to the telephone than to the email. So if you um, wanted to touch base with me, email, as I said, is probably the best way to reach me. I also wanna mention really quickly that um, I will be doing a few uh, live events coming up here soon. So those of you who are in Florida, um, there is uh, a career development day happening on uh, September 8th in Orlando. Check out the Florida page um, if you have questions about that. And then of course the National Dead Alumni Association Conference is going to be in Denver later in September. Uh, let me know if you have questions about that. And Bahia, that is all the content I had. Um, I, I'm not sure if you would like me to um, get into the chat or if you would like to read the questions um, or what makes sense. Um, thank you, Emily, for the really informative webinar. Um, I'll take the questions and uh, to ask a question, the attendees can use the raise hand function. I believe when you hover over your name on the webinar, you can rate, click a hand, picture of a hand and it'll raise your hand and then I can allow you to speak. Um, and I'll take those questions in turn. Or uh, you can type your question into the chat box or the Q&A box if you don't wanna speak it out loud and I can read it out to Emily for you. Um, before I take questions, I also wanna mention that the September 8th career event in Florida is sponsored by USJAA and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation grant for JET alumni chapters. So 
that's one of the types of things that we do with that, that funding. So um, we're really excited that Emily is going to make it, and I am actually going to be at that event as well. All right. So if you have a question, um, raise your hand or type it into the chat box. And Emily, I have a question for you. Um, yes. The JET program is really gaining recognition, um, but how do you recommend explaining JET and what a JET, what you did as an ALT or a CIR um, to a prospective employer who may not have heard of the JET program? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and in the one of the slides, I actually had a, a quick um, piece of information from my own resume. Uh, and you'll see that I listed my employer as the Hokkaido Board of Education. Uh, you, can, you can do that, so you can list um, your, your uh, whichever um, Kyoku Inkai or, or whatever organization you reported to, or you can say Japan Exchange and Teaching Program uh, as your employer. And what I like to do with that is um, to be very specific with it. Uh, I think it's really important in the description to talk about not just the teaching part of it, uh, unless you want to uh, be a teacher, uh, but talk about the international intercultural pieces of it. So you can say, you know, demonstrated American culture in a classroom of junior high students by whatever. Uh, and so to really get into the, the details of what that looked like um, and, and really talk about those kind of bigger picture issues with it. Uh, for instance, I, you've probably, uh, many of you have done similar things. Um, I had a few cooking classes with my students and was able then to talk about uh, the U.S. as a country of immigrants. So one day I, uh, we made spaghetti sauce and I talked about how um, Italian immigrants to the U.S. Um, have, you know, made our food culture very kind of Italo-centric. I did not say that to them, um, but uh, how that kind of um, piece of history was uh, part of what we did. And so that's the kind of thing that you can really talk about on your resumes um, it's a little bit hard for me to talk in generalities uh, with resumes because they are ideally very specific to each job. Um, but think about kind of the ways that what you hope to be doing intersect with um, the kinds of things that you've done uh, in a broad sort of sense. Um, kind of a semi answer. Let me know um, if any of you have more specific questions about that. So we just had a question come in from the Q&A box. Um, Rodrigo asks, uh, well says, hi Emily, thanks so much for your information. I came back after a year in Okinawa and I've decided to pursue freelance writing as a career. Nice. But I have no professional writing experience. What would be my first steps? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so I would start actually initially, Rodrigo, by finding people in your area who are freelance writers. Um, just do a Google search, you know, you can put in your, your city or town name and freelance writer um, and see if you can find information on those particular individuals. And in a perfect world, I would recommend that you reach out to them and say, I'm launching this as my career path. Um, can I pick your brain a little bit? Beyond that, um, you, you certainly have experience in writing, even if it wasn't professionally. Uh, and so you can begin doing a few small things. You can um, submit articles to local publications. Um, you can do a blog. Um, it, the nice thing about a blog is anyone can do it and um, potential employers can pop in and look at, at your writing style and see what that's like. And then uh, there are some online um, kind of writing and editing specific job boards. I I think most of them are paid, meaning you have to uh, pay a membership fee to see the job postings. Um, but I would also recommend that you, you search for a few of those and just see what kind of information you can get on those for free. And then the final piece I would recommend is to see if you can find a local organization um, that's kind of a, a professional development association um, that covers writing in general in your area. Professional organizations are really powerful ways to get started in this. Uh, and for writing in particular, they will be able to tell you things like how to put together 
um, a portfolio that demonstrates your skills and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, the nice thing is with, with freelance writing, um, your best selling point is going to be your current writing. And so the more you can do things like blogging uh, or writing um, articles for local publications, the easier it's going to be for them to see what that looks like and to really um, get a sense of, of your particular voice in writing. Uh, and if you have questions about finding some of those, um, the job boards that hire folks like that, let me know. I can uh, poke around through my resources and see what I can find. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really helpful. Um, Rodrigo, I also want to let you know we haven't announced it officially yet, but USJAA is partnering with the East-West Center. And in September, we will be announcing a new program where JET um, alumni were seeking writers for the Japan Matter Matters for America um, website that is run by the East-West Center, and we will be taking submissions for that. And should you be accepted, it will be paid for that submission. So I Very encourage cool. you to check our website pretty soon. Um, it'll, it's not up there yet, but it will be up there soon. So I'm giving you kind of the heads up. Um, but yeah, definitely check that out as soon as we launch that. Um, okay. Uh, if anybody has any additional questions, you can type them in the chat box or the Q&A and you are able to ask uh, questions anonymously using the Q&A box, I believe. So um, give that a try if you're not comfortable uh, sharing your name. Um, there's another question, Emily, about having a physical address. Um, mm -hmm. Is it okay to just put your city and state instead of your home address? And if you're from out of state, from where the job that you're applying for is, mm -hmm. does that hurt your chances of getting accepted to that position? Yeah, excellent, excellent questions. Uh, as far as I can tell, simply a city and state as your physical address are typically fine um, with most applicant tracking systems. The applicant tracking systems tend to change fairly quickly. So that is the latest information that I have. It could change. Um, I would actually, um, if you have very specific questions on that, I would recommend that you um, go to the job scan dot co website and look for their articles. They tend to be very up to the minute on that kind of stuff. Uh, but as a rule, simply the city and state is generally enough. Uh, the out of state question or the out of city question is a really good one. Um, the short answer is it's probably slightly less than ideal if you're out of state. However, depending on the size of the organization at which you are applying, um, it's not infrequent for, for organizations to do either regional or national searches. Uh, and as long as you are open to moving uh, and don't necessarily anticipate that um, the employer is going to pay any relocation costs, uh, that's typically fine. And what you'll often find with those kinds of jobs is, uh, especially if it's a national search, there will be a question at the front end of the application that's something like, are you willing to relocate to California? Uh, and obviously you should tick yes if you are. Uh, if you're not, your application is probably not going to get viewed, um, particularly because they asked that at the very beginning. So it's a slight disadvantage. It has not traditionally been something that's insurmountable. Um, if you find the job posted um, in a, a national kind of um, database, usually you're fine. It used to be a fairly common perk for employers to uh, pay relocation expenses. There aren't very many of them doing it now, although often the very well-funded organizations will. Uh, so what you can do with that is uh, put something in your cover letter that says something like, I am planning to relocate to Massachusetts in January and that kind of thing. So they understand that um, you are comfortable with the idea of the move and that you don't necessarily expect them to pay your relocation expenses. Great, thank you so much. So we have two more questions that have come in so far. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is from uh, an anonymous question asker. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, can you tell us more about those of us who have been back over 15 or 20 years? How yeah, do you absolutely. use JET experience in your resume, especially if you have over 10 years of work experience? 
Yeah, excellent question. Um, so um, it, it obviously does depend on um, what you uh, are doing now and what you hope to do. Um, but you can really talk about, um, and I certainly am in that boat, but you can talk about um, the ways that you did demonstrate those kind of cross-cultural understanding pieces um, and those um, kind of whatever other pieces you wanted to mention. So I, I said earlier that um, I did some translation work um, for my local government, and so I, I mentioned that usually in my resume. Um, and what I tend to do with that stuff, honestly, is weave it in to the skills section at the very beginning. So uh, let me back up here, um, if it will let me. So here. So this skill section right here is a place where you can really weave a lot of that information in. So for example, you'll see on skill number three, I have conflict resolution training and experience. You don't actually have to have formal training in that. You could have a point here that's something like demonstrated conflict resolution in and talk about that experience. So this skill section is a really nice way to weave that kind of information in um, without necessarily saying, you know, but that was 15 years ago. But I would definitely recommend that you have uh, towards the bottom of your relevant experience um, that if you, you maintain the JET experience on there anyway. It floats in mine. I normally tell people not to go back more than around 10 years um, in their uh, experience, but that, so things like um, JET program, Peace Corps military experience, uh, those are exceptions. I recommend people keep that information uh, in their resumes for pretty much all time. Oops, went too far. Um, I hope that answers your question, anonymous question asker. If it doesn't, please drop me an email. I will be glad to uh, follow up with you more specifically given your specific situation. Thanks, Emily. Uh, we have another question from Nick. Uh, Nick says, thanks so much, Emily, for the great info. I'm a current JET beginning my fourth year. I graduated with an engineering degree and spent about six months as a professional mechanical engineer before becoming a JET. Wow. I'm interested in a return to engineering after my fourth year. Mm -hmm. However, while I'm happy with my Japanese language progress over my time on JET, uh, he has level N2, I'm a nice. bit concerned with my gap in technical experience. What would you recommend I do over the next year to make myself more attractive to potential engineering employers? Nice. Yeah, good question, Nick. Um, what I would recommend is that you do a little bit of research on the kinds of positions you are going to be looking for when you get back um, and see if there are um, some specific pieces of, of um, software that you uh, have access to that you can play around with and stay up to date on. There might not be a lot of times those uh, specific program, programs are, are either proprietary or prohibitively expensive. Um, in which case there's not necessarily a whole lot you can do unless you have an opportunity to do that kind of work, uh, maybe where you are. Um, so you can ask around um, to your friends and see if they, uh, for example, know of someone who's doing any of that kind of tech work. Uh, and you can play around with similar programs that they might be using um, at a, an agency there. Um, if that's not possible, and if you can't figure out a way to um, do some kind of self-learning um, or, or to play around with a particular new program being used in what you're going to be doing when you get back, um, don't lose hope. What you can do when you do get back is look at places like workforce centers and local community colleges. Uh, and those are going to be places where you can um, refresh any skills that you feel have gotten rusty uh, or you can even just get a certificate if you don't think that your skills are rusty, but you want to demonstrate um, new learning in, in whatever you're looking at. Um, workforce centers do vary. So what you'll typically find is that larger cities have um, more robust workforce centers. Uh, these are the things that we used to call the unemployment offices. Um, and the larger cities with the more robust ones will obviously because of that have access to more technology. Um, but community colleges are a fabulous resource otherwise. And so if you just needed to get, uh, for instance, recertified in a piece of technology, um, I would say look at your local community colleges. You might even be able to enroll as a distance student and get any kind of certification now. Um, if that's possible, I would recommend it because um, you have a job now with a steady income. 
uh, and so you wouldn't have to worry about paying tuition um, when you're in the position of not having a job. So if you can do that now, I would definitely recommend it. Um, and if you can't, uh, let me know if, if any of that stuff is kind of a barrier for you. We can talk more specifically about what you'd like to do. Um, but often you can just kind of play around with the, the uh, I don't know, say AutoCAD. Um, if you have um, a copy for yourself of that program, then you can play around with it on your own. And you can actually have a section that's, you know, designed X and Y and Z. Um, and so a lot of times the skills section um, doesn't have to be things that you've done for pay. So you can also do those things on your own. Um, I had a, a I think it was uh, someone who wanted to work in um, aviation technology uh, and um, put, after he'd met with me and talked to me for a while, um, I had him put down that he um, is a hobbyist in um, model rockets. So he makes little, you know, model rockets that actually launch. Um, obviously, they don't get into space, but things like that that you do as a hobby can also count um, under those tech um, kind of skilling questions. I hope that answered your question, Nick. Um, thanks, Emily. And I actually have a few comments about this one as well. My husband was a JET who had a bachelor's degree in uh, manufacturing systems, engineering, and business, went on the JET program, did JET for three years, ended up living in Japan for a total of nine years, um, doing mostly teaching, though he did have, um, he did do some other engineering related things while he was there. And when we moved to the United States, um, he ended up working as a technician for a company that really wants, they still felt that his technical experience was relevant um, and probably in part because he, he has stayed up to date with the field while he was in Japan. Um, but also since it's a Japanese company, they were really excited by the fact that he had that interest in cultural differences intercultural communication and the Japanese ability. So I think um, that you can find uh, other JET alumni who uh, were in a similar field to yours and then did the JET program and were able to come back to the US and find a job that allowed them to kind of integrate their engineering skills and their language skills. Um, so I just thought it might be helpful to hear a success story. <laughs> um, yes. And my husband has, ended, has been working for that company for 10 years now and you've risen up through the ranks. So Thanks. it worked out very, very well. So, That's awesome, thank uh, you. Have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, and if Nick, Nick, if you want to ask any specific questions, I could connect you with him. Um, you can email me at director at usjda.org. All right, we have one final question and I think that's all we have time for. Okay. Uh, this one's from Javier. Javier says, hello, Emily. Thank you very much for your informative webinar. I have returned to the States after being on the JET program for two years. Over the past several months, I've developed an interest in working with languages and using my multilingual skills to work in translation, interpretation, or localization. Where nice. would you suggest I start looking for a career in this field? Yeah, excellent question. Um, I would recommend that you begin actually by um, doing what are called informational interviews. Um, Informational interviews are, um, you, you would reach out to someone, say someone who is doing uh, translation work um, in your local community. You reach out and say something like, hello, so-and-so, you don't know me, um, but I am launching my career in this field. I just don't know very much about it yet. Uh, do you have a half an hour or so to talk to me over the next couple of weeks? I'll buy you a cup of coffee. And then once you've gotten one of those set up, you ask all of the things you really want to know um, and have kind of a really nice conversation. What you'll typically find with interpretation and translation is um, that there are fairly easy ways to get um, the credentials that you need for that. So there are uh, organizations that will credential you for translation, for interpretation, and they tend to be fairly specific. So for instance, if you wanted to do medical interpretation, um, depending on where you live, there's usually a very high need for that, um, which means that a lot of um, hospitals and medical clinics are willing to forego any credentialing. Whereas if you were doing something that was more like document translation, 
um, they want you to have some kind of certificate that demonstrates that you can do that um, because those tend to be sort of higher levels of pay involved. Um, and, and so they, there's, they kind of want a little bit of a demonstration that you can do that. Um, so, um, and the localization is really going to depend on your, your community and the kinds of needs that they're looking for um, right now and, and kind of what your economy is. Um, so I can't really speak specifically on that, but I would say begin by reaching out to those folks to see what is uh, kind of the expectation and the need. The other really important piece of that, to me at least, is to make sure that you actually enjoy the work. Uh, when I first got back from Japan, I thought, well, people with language skills obviously do translation, duh, right? Um, but it turns out I hated it. I was really bored with it. Um, it doesn't help matters that what I was uh, helping to translate was um, a, a lawsuit about rubber patent infringement um, between, between Gates uh, and Bondi rubber. Um, and so the, the content was really boring, but I also uh, found that that um, kind of dry sitting in a room um, translating patent documents was, um, I, I wasn't a social enough kind of engagement for me. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to name that beforehand. So I think talking with people who do the actual work of it will really help you um, decide if there's a place that's a better fit for you. Um, in those kind of arenas um, with the languages. And the other thing I would encourage you to do, honestly, is to look uh, into the possibility of linguistics as a career path. Linguistics can be a really nice fit because it's uh, a social science uh, and it just looks at the ways that uh, language changes us, the way language enters our brains and what it means for cultures when we use certain um, words to convey certain messages. And it's actually, I think, a really fascinating field. It is typically a PhD requiring field, um, but I would say keep that as an option in the back of your brain as well, um, or in the front of your brain if you're all gung-ho for a PhD program, um, because I think that's a really fascinating topic and um, can be, it's a specialized niche, so it can be a little bit easier to get into after you've completed any PhD work. Uh, and doesn't necessarily require a whole bunch of certifications. The problem with translation interpretation is depending on the languages that you're using, uh, you might have to accrue a bunch of certifications or, or other credentials to prove to people in multiple arenas that you're capable of doing it, um, which is just kind of a pain. It's not difficult and many translation agencies will help you get those, um, but I, I also tend to favor simplifying your search if that's at all possible. So Javier, I hope that answered your question. If not, um, and, and for the rest of you as well, definitely feel free to drop me an email. I would love to chat with you more, each of you, about kind of what you're looking to do and what your specific needs are. Um, we're also hoping, we can't swear to anything yet, but we are hoping to get some more grants moving forward that would allow me to um, see you all for free. Um, don't know where that is in the process right now, but we have had some luck in the past. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled um, and keep your eyes on, on, I think probably the Facebook page is the best place to find out where we are in that process. We will announce things as soon as we know anything about it. Great, thank you so much, um, Emily, for all of that great information. Yeah. It was a really interesting webinar. I hope it was really helpful to everybody. And I'd like to thank, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, I hope it was helpful as well. <laughs> and I'd like to thank everybody who, uh, who called in today for joining this webinar. Um, it's our second one in our alumni webinar series. And uh, I'm really excited that so many people were able to join. Our, as a reminder, our next scheduled webinar, So You Finished the JET Program, Now What? is um, also in our alumni webinar series and that will be on October 18th at 5 p.m. Pacific time and 8 p.m. Eastern time. Along with Emily, we will have um, uh, Rob Uwe and Kamala, Kamara Tofolo uh, speaking. So there'll be three different people speaking um, from, they're all, they all have expertise in careers and recruiting and various things and it'll be really helpful. So I hope you can attend. You can find more details about that webinar on our website and, and our Facebook page. 
All right, and then stay tuned for the recording of this webinar to be posted within the next week. It will be available on the USJDA website, our Facebook page, and the Facebook event page for this. Thank you all so much for joining. Bye.